This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Riley Smith. Good day and welcome to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Riley Smith. Today is Thursday, October 12th, 2023. It's a rainy day here in Des Moines, but we're still glad you could join us for today's show. In today's episode, I talk with Craig Rogers of Bayer about their foreground program and how it functions as a first step into sustain, uh, sustainable agriculture for farmers. We also take a look at that ag weather outlook, but first, let's run down the markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. At the end of another trading day in the ag marketplace, we're talking with Kurt Kimmel of agmarket.net. Now, Kurt, today being a WASDE report day, first off, what did we see from that WASDE? Well, surprise, surprise, surprise on the market reaction, that is. We uh, anticipated uh, slight changes and it it was a little bit more than slight, not a whole lot, but the market reacted quite well to the upside on the news. Uh, Yield-wise, uh, corn yield 173 bushels per acre. That was down 0.8, just a little less than what the trade was looking for. Uh, they had the smaller carry-in from the old crop as they squared away the grain stocks and fi- tried to finalize the 22. Anyway, uh, long story short, they lowered demand a little bit to offset the ending stocks on corns. 2.11 billion bushels, 110 million bushels uh, uh, below uh, the last estimate there. Uh, good news is the average cash price went up five cents, 4.95 from the previous month there. So uh, a little positive uh, news there as far as the supply demand balance sheet goes. Uh, soybeans, about the same thing as far as yield goes. They lowered the yield a half a bushel per acre down to 49.6. And in return, uh, you know, we had a ending stocks left unchanged at 220 million bushels. And that was due to mainly uh, decreasing this exports a little bit by 35 million bushels down to 1.755. And the exports is going to be the key from here on out as we hope Asia comes in and gets some grain booked here for this fall and winter. Because logistics wise, uh, we're the most available supply of uh, soybeans and we need to get those purchases on the books and and in the workings because as the calendar turns 2024, most of the shift will come uh, to the southern hemisphere. We've got, uh, you know, the market trying to hold together here. Uh, technically on the corn, $5 is resistance in December futures. Uh, the soybeans up here at the $13, we banged against those numbers in through here. We need to get above that to generate uh, some more technical buy programs. Uh, December wheat futures, five seventy five dollars up against the 20-day uh, moving average. Uh, <clears throat> so technically, if we can get above those levels, that would help the market a little bit uh, more as we move forward here. Uh, What the trade will shift towards now, as I hinted on there, is day-to-day demand. Uh, Need to see these exports pick up and uh, give the market a little enthusiasm uh, as they try to book needs here as we go into this winter. Uh, The other part is actual harvest activities, more yield data. Uh, see what uh, actual yields come in at. We're still highly variable, highly variable. We're seeing uh, guys in one field at uh, bushels, 85 bushel beans down the road, 65 bushels. Uh, but for the most part, these bean yields are coming in a little bit higher uh, than uh, what one hoped for. So uh, I'm not quite for sure or kind of feel maybe this bean yield on today's report might be the smallest uh, one, uh, even if that trend continues. Uh, on corn, still uh, kind of in this uh, 220, 260 around our area. Uh, better than what they were anticipated in June, but no record breakers uh, widespread. There is some areas that did quite well. They got some rain uh, uh, on, on that. The biggest thing uh, as we keep moving in here, uh, the decision for do I store or do I sell starts to run out here fairly quickly. 
and uh, hopefully you can get a hold of a ag market team member here to help you work through that process. One last thing as far as uh, what to look for, a uh, fairly good rain event, particularly in the upper Midwest here. Uh, that's hopefully will not all soak in <laughs> being greedy here. We want some of that to go down the Mississippi, down the river system to kind of help that out. But as, dry, as short as we are with soil moisture deficits, it's going to take a lot of rain here this winter to get that uh, river uh, level a little higher. I kind of feel that it's kind of bottomed out as far as freight rates go. Uh, barge uh, uh, tariffs and everything on that. So uh, that will be the uh, one last thing it was we'll watch as we move into this winter here on, on soil moisture recharging. And of course, you know, obviously a big focus today on the grain side of things with that WASD, but what do we see going on in the livestock markets as well? Uh, we, we saw uh, cattle, hogs, uh, they did update production numbers. Uh, we're looking at a few more uh, tonnage as we go into 2024. Uh, Price-wise is kind of stable for the most part. Uh, not a whole lot of big shift in through here. Uh, technically here on the cattle, we're in a situation where a uh, good week here, a couple of days on the technical side of the picture, we should be able to go up and challenge the recent downtrend line. Uh, still looking at tight numbers as a whole. Uh, Hog-wise, um, we're seeing the market stay within last week's uh, trading range. So we'll see if we'll get a breakout of that. Of course, somebody told me once this pork October, so we'll see what uh, demand comes at us here as we move forward. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention on the grain side of the equation is uh, tomorrow, Friday, we'll have the weekly export sales report. That was delayed or postponed an extra day because Monday was a government holiday. The trade's looking for wheat sales to be 300 to 500,000 tons, corn 600 to 900,000 tons, soybeans 650 to 1 million metric tons. And that is as of last week there. Lots of great information today, Kurt, for those of our listeners and our viewers who would like to get in touch and learn more from the folks at agmarket.net. Like you mentioned earlier, how can they do that? Uh, go to agmarket.net. Click on Intel, and we will have a update, a video update of the uh, team's analytical analysis or what their thoughts are on the, today's numbers. It'll be right there in a short video. And where else you can give us a call here in normal Illinois, 1 800 779 1515. Great talking with you as always, Kurt, and we look forward to hearing more great analysis from you soon. Very good. Take care. That again was Kurt Kimmel of agmarket.net. We'll take a look at how those numbers close. That's courtesy of the folks at Bar Chart. December corn is up 8 even at 496 even. November soybeans up 37 and a half at 1290 even. December soybean meal up 1580 at 392.90. Soybean oil up 65 cents at 5337. Chicago wheat up 15 and a half at 571 and a half. Minneapolis spring wheat up 5 and a quarter at 723 and a half. Kansas City hard red wheat up seven and three quarters at six seventy five even. December oats down twelve and a quarter at three eighty three and a half. On the Merck, December live cattle up eighty two cents at one eighty seven eighty. November feeders up one fifty seven at two fifty three fifty seven. December lean hogs up twelve cents at seventy ten. Pork cut out down seventeen cents at seventy nine sixty two. November class three milk up nine cents at seventeen thirty two. And that's been a check of the markets here on Ag Matters PM. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. When we come back, I talk with Craig Rogers of Bayer about their foreground program. This is Ag Matters PM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Riley Smith. It can be pretty daunting to switch over to sustainable ag practices, especially new ones that re require a lot of change on your operation. Bayer has a program called Foreground that helps farmers make those decisions, uh, kind of compare the different options they have to get into sustainable agriculture, and then once they jump into it, provide some support and additional data to allow them to feel good about that choice or even switch to a different option. 
I talked with Craig Rogers of Bayer about just all of the details of Foreground as it was when we had talked, it was just shy of its one year anniversary. Now you mentioned that Foreground just shy of its one year anniversary. Uh, first, just give us a little bit of an explanation of what Foreground does and, and just what it offers for producers and those advantages they can, uh, that they can use. Sure, and thanks for talking to me today. So uh, Bayer Foreground is farmers' uh, first step into sustainable agriculture. It's Bayer's one-stop shop for farmers to learn all things about regenerative agriculture. Uh, these are things from strip-till and no-till to cover crops, um, and finding ways that growers can kind of start to implement this into their operation. Uh, it's you know no cost to participate, and through just being part of this process, you find out about new exciting opportunities to get paid for these practices, as well as new benefits that can come to you as a grower through benefit uh, collaborations. And, you know, I think it's important to have that you know no cost to participate because it's also potential profit that you're seeing from those programs. And uh, when we see these new regenerative ag programs, obviously no-till been around for a while, but we. We see this other carbon capture and all that. You know, farmers are looking and maybe a little hesitant because they, you know, see the new program. Uh, but to get involved with that, start with the no-till, get more and more, see the benefits. Uh, having something like foreground to get them into it is obviously a really big benefit, right? That's right. And, and as you said, like no-till isn't new. It's been around for many decades. Uh, but there's there's good things that we can learn from the past, uh, whether that's through growers in our program, as well as we have a team of agronomists dedicated to helping guide farmers through this journey together. Um, and with that, you know, new revenue streams is always exciting. Right. Um, and when you start to add up the dollars that you can save through, say, no-till using less uh, fuel on your fields, using less labor, which is harder and harder to find every year, um, when you start to add even just the smallest amount of money for a carbon payment, it starts to really add up to offset that risk. Right, we know those producers are always looking for that return on investment and just maximizing the profits they're getting every year from those crops. Because like I said, you know, those margins are getting tighter and tighter. Labor getting, you know, uh, much more difficult to find. Uh, you know, getting that extra dollar wherever they can to maybe increase their practices while not decreasing in other areas is obviously a very big focus, right? That's right, that's right. And, uh, you know, and that's where like things such as even like strip till, you know, nutrient management p plays into this significantly, right? Uh, I think as the state of Illinois, we recognize that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis being placed on reducing nitrogen across the state. And although we don't necessarily have a program currently in place for a nitrogen reduction strategy, we do have a lot more information coming out about this for farmers to responsibly go about this way without losing the farm and betting wrong on it, right? Right, and you know, we, we see those, uh the strategy is becoming more and more prevalent because, you know, being based in Iowa, we have the uh, we have our nutrient reduction strategy going on. Uh, so it's becoming a little more up to the forefront uh, and being able to see those uh, regenerative ag practices keep going. Obviously, a really great thing. Now, Colin, uh, you know, we want to get them started in these regenerative ag practices. Where does it go next from there? How can they get more involved when they're thinking about that? Sure. So first and foremost, I mean, the Bear Foreground website is a great place to get started. And speaking with one of our agronomists is even a better way to get started. Uh, but I never want to discount the fact that, you know, every county has an NRCS office, FSA office, and these people are dedicated to serve farmers. Uh, sometimes we look the other way. We know we walk in there. There might be a lot of paperwork involved. Uh, but really, there's no such thing as too much information in the regenerative agriculture space because there's a lot of buzz out there, right? Um, we want to make sure farmers are all informed for the best decision for their operation operation, not necessarily everybody's operation. Right, uh, that's a very big thing. That's where I was uh, going next with is every farm is so different and even different areas on certain farms can vary greatly uh, from other fields. So you know, like you said, very important to talk with especially that agronomist and make sure that uh, the regenerative act practice fits you because it's very adaptable. No, that's absolutely right. You know, I like to tell farmers to dip their toe in the water. Uh, specifically, I like to say pick a field that's really close to your house, preferably right behind your machine shed, right? Something you can keep an eye on as you go through this process. Um, and then do strip trials. Use products such as Climate Field View to really kind of visualize the change in your field. Um, and recognize that things like cover crops, even no-till, they're not necessarily designed for every acre of every farm, but there's some acres that they definitely should be used on. Um, and there's other acres that things such as strip till may play a little better onto that ground. All right, Colin, lots of great information today. Uh, for those of our listeners and our viewers who would like to get in touch and learn more, uh, how can they do that? You know, where should they reach out first? Sure. So like I said, I would reach out to uh, bearforeground.com. Uh, that's probably the best place to go uh, for the most information right off the bat. And from there, you'll actually be able to be link up with one of our agronomists for more information. That again was Craig Rogers of Bayer. Let's go ahead and take a look at that ag weather outlook.
Most of the farmers are probably out of the fields today as rain has pretty much gone across most of the state. Uh, here in Des Moines, we still have uh, rainy skies and plenty of moisture coming down, which of course, got to look at, get, or you can't look a gift horse in the mouth. When you get that moisture, you got to hope that it fills up those moisture deficits that we've been seeing over the past few years. Looking into tomorrow, again, more rain. Into the weekend, much cooler temperatures than those low 50s. Uh, a lot of that fall weather, and it seems to keep getting even cooler. Always feels like fall is way short compared to the rest of the seasons, especially as we get into winter, the longest season here in Iowa. So let's see what the National Weather Service has in store for the next 24 hours. As you can see from the National Weather Service, we have some beautiful weather ahead here. Today we have sunny skies and fall temperatures with the highs ranging from about 60 to the mid-60s. Tonight clear with patchy areas of frost, lows overnight ranging from the low to upper 30s. And tomorrow there will be some areas of frost in the morning, then we'll have sunny skies once again, lows ranging from the low to upper 60s. And taking a look at the affiliate weather map for tomorrow, Cherokee will be sunny with a high of 60, Shenandoah sunny and 69, Des Moines sunny and 67, Waterloo sunny and 63, Albia sunny and 67, and Clinton will see sunny skies with a high of 62. You can find a more detailed forecast in your part of the state by checking in with your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate. And if you don't know your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate, head on over to iowaagnet.com. You can see a list of our affiliates under our affiliate map. And of course, check out all the rest of the content on our website, our five daily ag news stories and all of the rest of our daily content. You can also check us out on social media, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. And you can find our video content as well as previous episodes of AMPM on our YouTube channel. Make sure while you're there, you subscribe and hit the notification bell to see when those videos go live. Don't forget as well, our free twice daily market podcast on Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and Podbean. From the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network studios in Des Moines, I'm Riley Smith. On behalf of Mark Magnuson, Dustin Huffman, and Andy Peterson, we thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.